Welcome back to the Nutramedical Report, and we have the uh, remarkable, the amazing Professor James McCanny on. And, of course, uh, Professor McCanny, let's give the uh, short version of your website, and you have some very shocking and interesting news to say, which I think, believe it or not, even trumps the election in terms of what's going to happen in the next few years in terms of plasma activity in our solar system. Uh, people need to be aware of the fiscal cliff with Obama, which is a picture that I'm posting up on our Clay and Iron for today's show, uh, is nothing compared to what's coming with the approach of l- large objects that are highly charged into our solar system. And being the scientist that brought I call the electric or plasma universe model uh, to the public more than any other scientist, tell us what's happening and what's likely to happen in the next few years as uh, a light show and also dangers to the planet Earth. Well, the, uh, the Comet C-2012-S1, uh, I just put a posting on the, the web page, on my web page, showing that it would, uh, in January 2014, uh, have an electrical alignment with Jupiter, Earth, what I call the new moon passing, and the planet Venus. So we have about uh, close to a billion miles of, of plasma discharging here, you know, linearly, and Earth is right in the middle. So what are the effects? Uh, we could probably see some pretty stringent, uh, pretty heavy-duty weather, and also uh, what I'm calling the sulfur effects from Jupiter. Yeah, and uh, so, heavy-duty weather means we're going to have what kind of weather? Uh, is this toxic rain basically lethal? We know that when uh, the Halley's Comet passed through the Earth's tail, uh, there are organophosphate toxins in the tail of the, of the comet that were predicted that could kill people or make them very sick or behave in a, in a so-called called bizarre mental ways. Let's put it that way. Uh-huh. Yeah, the, um, uh, the, what, the situation here is we're connecting into Jupiter. There's a lot of sulfur dioxide out by Jupiter, and uh, the comet will be pulling that in, so you're going to have some sulfur-based compounds uh, with the hydrogen, also on the comet tail, you would be getting sulfuric, ox- sulfuric acid. And uh, the ancients, the last time that this happened was during what we call the Moses event, uh, when they talked about what was uh, they called it the red hand of death. Basically, yes. it was the sulfur dioxide um, <clears throat> coming into the atmosphere at that time, and uh, that's what they saw, that's what they experienced. Yeah, that, that sounds very scary. Um, now, these are our dates are pretty fixed, aren't they? They're you know within a range of, of date times. Uh, you, this is a fairly large object. This uh, this comet is 25 kilometers across, estimated, but it may be bigger than that because we're not getting full data disclosure from the uh, government. But it's at least that large. Um, are there any other objects? I know that there's this uh, 2012 DA14 passing on my birthday, February 15th, uh, less than 5,000 miles from the surface of the Earth. They won't give us data since May. The government has decided to make everything go black. It's all black op. It's now no longer available to the public, even other branches of government, which I find very concerning. And uh, one of the things I found out from my contacts inside the Pentagon, Homeland Security, and other federal agencies, they asked three questions. Who's on Deagle's program? What questions are they asking, and how the heck do they know it? And uh, that's important because the different agencies in the government don't talk to each other. They don't share data. They don't share ideas. And as you've said before, Tier 1 science or knowledge in any area isn't being shared even with other Tier 1 scientists in other adjacent areas, departments, or countries. So it's very stupid. It's very dangerous when we don't have a collaborative effort to protect the planet Earth or even ask the right questions. I find this yeah. very, very, uh, you know, if, if man wants to extinct himself, the first thing he needs to do is is get a bit of a clue that you can't behave this way if you're dealing with something that could be extinction-level events. Yeah, well, the, the situation, too, with the January 2014 event is that uh, this, is, this could potentially affect water. In other words, the pollution of water to the point where unless you have it in uh, sealed containers... Uh, that's what uh, you remember the Moses event. They talked about the poisoning of waters. Yeah, the wormwood. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, and so the the situation is is uh, uh, rather difficult, and so it's hard to predict. Excuse me, it's hard to predict any of these events. But uh, the, when I look at all of the conditions there, and the comet will be right out behind Earth. That's when the comet will be closest to Earth. It will have just gone 
uh, to its closest approach to Earth, and then it gets up and behind us. And we've seen the past uh, incidents of this kind of comet reaction with a comet called Comet Lee, 1999, that gave us five hurricanes in the Atlantic at one time, uh, including Hurricane Floyd. But uh, uh, that's one incident. By the way, uh, this coming January, we have a little... Uh, what might be a mini interaction with that comet and comet Earth, with the uh, an alignment of just Earth and the comet, and oddly enough, also we have a new moon passing. It's uh, two days after the new moon. What happens is the um, uh, the moon is between us and the sun at, at new moon. When it moves out of the way, what it's been doing during new moon is blocking the solar wind. Uh, with forming a little comet activity there, but basically two days later when it moves out from between Earth and the Sun, uh, that solar wind all of a sudden starts crashing in. It, it hits our uh, magnetic uh, field about 35,000 miles out to the sunward side from Earth, compresses it, and it drives, it's like a spark plug, it drives Earth's arms. And so, at any rate, uh, January. So, in other words, 15, we should expect some uh, superstorms around that time of the year. We, we could expect some serious winter weather if we're in winter or in the tropics, too, around January 15th. And it'll be a test of, to see how significant this comet is. Uh, the comet won't be near Earth, it'll actually be out around the orbit of Jupiter. But uh, uh, the next, I, I've got a whole laundry list of encounter dates of that comet with other planets. There will be some very close ones with Mercury as the comet moves in. And then uh, that's uh, coming up uh, in uh, probably late summer this, this coming year, 2013. Now, these so, can have a tremendous amount of energy and charge stored on them, you know. Uh, trillions of gigajoules of energy that can be discharged, causing earthquakes, volcanoes, major superstorms, uh, and coronal mass ejections because it gets through the, the outside, you uh, call the energetic sphere around the sun, which is called the chromosphere, isn't it? The, 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 uh, yeah, there's the uh, entire laundry list of interactions that can happen. Yeah, tell, uh, give us some of those and give us some details because we get a lot of people requesting it. They love listening to your hour because it gives people technical background. This is not just, quote, conspiracy theory. This is solidly based science. And if they're, you know, backyard astronomers or if they go to uh, even websites that can look at this, they can see these objects like the one you predicted will be passing through October 3rd uh, in a time period before and after it next year, 2013, that will be passing near Mars. The tail of that comet is really big. It's going to be. It's the same one we're talking about here, uh, yeah. and, it, and 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 Mars is going to pass through it, but it's going to come back in 2014 near us, and we're going to go through the tail of this as well. Yeah, we'll we'll be the comet will be behind us, but when we connect to it, we could become part of the comet, kind of a dual nucleus comet. You could think of it in that way, um, yeah. and so, uh, but but it, the thing is. It'll be in the night sky. The new moon, well, the moon's on the other side of the Earth, so what we'll have is a huge, huge comet up in the night sky. And you notice that NASA is not saying a word about any of this. Now, why now, that's would they... Really, yeah, that's really strange. Uh, why, you please tell, tell us more. Why would they do that? Well, they, they, they don't want anybody to notice this, and I, I think it's kind of funny because... Uh, it's kind of a catch-22. If they say something, then they'll tip people off to look for it. But if they don't say anything, when it comes and it becomes this monster in the sky, people are going to be saying, well, why didn't NASA tell us about this? Yeah, exactly. There's also real dangers to the planet as well, and, of course, preparedness. Maybe right. we'll add that to that list for doomsday preppers. I'm preparing for the passage of this comet in 2014. <laughs> but it's real. Back in a moment with but Professor McCanny. Welcome 
welcome back. And um, while we're on break, we're talking with Professor McCanny. Uh, and people love the science of this. Uh, there's a number of effects of plasma, and you've done the, the, the most amazing teaching on this, that the plasma discharge of a comet passing a planetary object like Earth can trigger off earthquakes, volcanoes. I remember traveling to Israel back in the early 90s, <coughs> and I was shown pictures of sulfur balls that burned pyrophorically at 6,000 degrees. These rained down from space. We know that whatever this passing object was at the time of Moses and at the time of Abraham and Lot, these objects, literally there were objects that rained down sulfur balls on Sodom and Gomorrah, burning at 6,000 degrees, burning through rock, burning through buildings and people. Uh, this hand of death thing indicates that if it passes in January 2014, <coughs> it can trigger off superquakes, extreme weather, uh, all kinds of dangers that we're not prepared for, are we? No, no. And uh, uh, one of the things in the Moses event, they had problems with water. <clears throat> it poisoned all the water. In other words, the sulfur dioxide powder got into the water systems and uh, poisoned them. So unless they had water in containers, very well sealed, uh, it basically poisoned all the water. Now, you mentioned, uh, interestingly, in your notes here uh, for your website, which is a, a really remarkable website, by the way, and you have your own radio show, you talked about the fact that there's this new history uh, channel special, six-part special called 2012 Countdown to Armageddon, and uh, they touch on some of these things in part four, uh, entitled Prophecies of the Hopi, and, uh, uh, you know, people need to know that all these things are converging on intuitive knowledge, but then there's also scientific validation that something major is about to happen. We know that the harp signal has been very high over California recently. We know it was high over the Northeast when this uh, Hurricane Sandy struck, which is we call an, an anomalous storm, which I think was steered and and the energy cells were pulled together uh, in a very timely fashion to make sure the surge for Romney didn't occur and it didn't tip the election because a very small tip would have perhaps made it win for Romney despite the negative gaffes by himself and the uh, missteps by the Republicans. So... Um, uh, this is really serious, and people need to take it to heart that, you know, this is not just like, oh, this is so entertaining, it's so weird, you know, this is no, we need to be prepared every day with food, water, supplies for ourselves and our friends, but we need to also start to realize that planetary and space weather can completely change everything. And, it, and then Moses did have some of the sacred knowledge. It was passed down by the high priest because he was trained by the high priest of ancient Egypt. He was actually supposed to be the next pharaoh, even though he was adopted, because his name Moses, people don't know his name is Moses, like so calling somebody Johnson, calling him son. His name would be Tut Moses. If his father was Tut, he would be Tut Moses. Uh, if, I think his father's name was Ramesses. So he would be, his actual name would be Ramesses Moses. In other words, who was taken out of Ramesses. And uh, most people don't know that when they call the name Moses, they don't understand the ancient uh, way of naming that Moses simply meant that he was, although he was adopted, he was going to be the next pharaoh. And he was superior intelligence, had all the training of the high priest, and he did know about these uh, signs in the heavens, so he was able to read them and understand that catastrophic things were about to happen. These people were very advanced. not They weren't as primitive as, as a lot of people nowadays think. That's, I like your uh, statement there about Moses, that he was trained by the high priest, and of course he grew up in, in the house of Pharaoh. Right. But, uh, then he led the, uh, uh, the, the, the slave people out, the embonded people. But yeah. it's very interesting that, yeah, he was educated, and it's just like today where the leaders <clears throat> of the world are aware of many of these things, but they don't let on to the public. That's why, like in my latest book, it's called The Diamond Principle, I emphasize the fact that there is a whole layer of garbage science that they pawn off on the public, and they have a whole layer of NASA scientists that promote this for the sole purpose of misinforming the public so that they can keep their knowledge and knowledge is power. It's just as simple as that. Yeah, and you have to look at what they're actually doing. Building underground cities, they have off-world space platforms. Our real space program is so much more advanced than what they try to tell us. And I know, having worked in security cleared at the U.S. Space Command, they said, now you want us, we're going to tell you everything. And they're very, very concerned about near-Earth objects. They know that they can't get them all. And, in fact, they should be collaborating with Russians and Chinese and other scientists because near-Earth objects like this, these giant comets 
could cause devastation on the planet. We already know the climate change is killing crops, and we know we're moving to an area of space that's very dangerous. Uh, in fact, according to the, some of the reports I've read and the, the research reports, there's 30 times more chance of an impact of a large a comet or asteroid on the planet that's roughly 1 in 22,000 every day. It's now 30 times higher than that because of the current area of space we're traveling through. So, you know, this is not statistically impossible either. Neither is a large coronal mass ejection that's geocentric and hits the Earth or with passage through the tail of a comet, which happened even in the last century. I think 1910, wasn't it, with Halley's Comet? And they'd known that it's recorded by monks that when you pass through the tail of the comet, animals die, people go crazy, people jump out of buildings, people do stupid things, cuz. And I remember being taught this by our anesthesiologist back when I was training in, in internal medicine, family medicine that the tail of comets has organophosphates and other neurotoxins in the tail of the comet. Yeah, the, uh, there, there are so many effects. When you go through the laundry list of effects of a passing comet, uh, this one will not be close enough to cause gravitational effects. Even if it's very big, uh, it would be far enough away. But yes. uh, the ability to connect electrically could set off uh, volcanoes, uh, there's a group of geologists I've been working with down in, actually in Mexico. They're Russian geologists working down in Mexico City. But their work deals with the electrical conditions around volcanoes and uh, the fact that they connect, just like a hurricane, connect to the upper ionosphere during an eruption. And there's uh, some amazing pictures uh, of volcanoes going off in the electrical activity around the plumes. The, the the electricity is coming out the side of the plumes. I was at a, a American Geophysical Union meeting one time, and I had one of those pictures on a poster at a poster session. And one of the geologists was saying, well, that's just the internals of the volcano. And I said, well, why is it shooting out the side of the plume? I said, batteries don't discharge outside of their battery operating, um, uh, battery, the voltage generating chemicals or right. whatever is causing them. And this electricity is shooting out the side of the plume. I said, this is being powered from above. Right. In uh, other words, it's a discharge. It's a, it's, it's, it's actually like the movie that's recently been put up for kids uh, called Frankenweenie. And, of course, they have this teacher uh, that's trying to, Mr. Reznutsky, and he's trying to teach the kids. He says, you know, that the, that the, that the, that the, the clouds are angry and want to go to ground. They want to go to the land of opportunity, which is ground. And the man on the ground gets hit with, the, with it because there's a ladder being built from the ground to the sky. So he's in between these two ladders, and then boom, he's in the way. So people have to understand there's a ground strike, and there's a strike from the ground and from the sky connecting these ladders. And so uh, the same thing with earthquakes and volcanoes. When these giant objects pass, and you've done more research than anybody, they can trigger major earth changes that are very devastating. Yeah, well, in the case of earth, uh, in the case of volcanoes, sounds like we're... we got 30 in, seconds. Go oh, ahead. Okay, in, in the case of volcanoes, what happens is that electrical discharge uh, finds its way down through uh, cracks and crevices, and that's where the water is. That's the explosion. A lot of people don't understand that an uh, explosion in a volcano is really a steam engine. Ah, yeah, that's really interesting. Welcome back, and uh, so this series is coming out. When, when is it going to start, uh, Professor McCanny, the uh, History Channel six-part special on 2012 Countdown to Armageddon? Um, a lot of people, I think, you mentioned on the break that, that Carl Sagan's uh, uh, talks back in the 70s, 13-part series, almost lulls people into a state of normalcy. As I say, normalcy is a lull between various catastrophes which happened. Like, last night was a political catastrophe, but there's environmental catastrophes coming, just like you mentioned. Uh, we talked to Stan Deo a few weeks ago. There's two new, uh, if you want to call spectral bands in the ultraviolet light spectra since 1992 that are bathing the earth, which is why the sun now is toxic, why people get pterygians and cataracts and skin cancer in young people that should never have got skin cancer. And uh, these solar and galactic events, even the monks knew it in the ancient peoples that comets, when they passed, were harbingers of death harbingers of destruction and terrible things were tied to comets and, and you've provided the scientific framework for explaining why that is so 
What do you think will be in this History Channel special? Well, uh, the uh, History Channel, by the way, it's History Channel 2, and I should, I, I uh, misstated, and I don't know how I, I managed to do this, but the name of the program is called Countdown to Apocalypse. And <laughs> I have posted ah, Armageddon, yeah, yeah. and uh, somehow in my brain I got those mixed up, but it's Countdown yeah, to uh, uh, Apocalypse. Well, but, I know what I'll uh, do is I'll correct that word, and, and uh, I'll correct that word on, uh, on what I posted up on the site here. So oh, okay. people see that at least on my side, you'll have to correct your own site. But I'll yeah, yeah, I'll correct it's, it's it here, corrected yeah. now. I corrected it this morning. But uh, ah, anyway, okay. uh, yeah, it's a six-part series. I did the filming last spring out in Los Angeles. Oh, you filmed uh, it all with them. You actually did some filming with the uh, with the History Channel. Right, right. And so I'm I'm uh, have a bit or piece in all of the six parts of this series. And then I'm featured in part four, where they talk about the prophecies of the Hopi. Uh, and at the very end of the part four is, uh, well, oops, you know, I shouldn't uh, say much more because I'm under kind of a, a, a silence order. Yeah, but, 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 but the Hopi, Hopi uh, prophecies are fit with biblical prophecies. Uh, it's my feeling that the, you know, then tell me if I'm on the right track. That the uh, the explosion of Mount Thera in the Eastern Mediterranean and the destruction of the Second Kingdom of the Egyptians is tied directly with the reign of debris, the passage of these this near Earth objects, the comet that caused these events and the volcanic events to happen, and the exodus of the uh, Hebrews, the ancient uh, two houses of Israel, occurred all conjoint with these natural events, which are caused by the plasma discharge and the volcanic. Activity. I think it's all tied together. And if you actually look at the environmental issues of the quote ten plagues that struck, oh, those absolutely. Plague, those yeah. plagues are all environmental to things like telluric currents, etc. All fit right. precisely with science that we know now. It says in the Book of Daniel, close up and seal to the time of the end. Every single thing fits in an environmental issue that would fall one issue after the other exactly in that sequence, which means it's again another example to prove that the Bible is true. But until this time when the science could understand it and people like yourself could understand it, we wouldn't know what this meant. We do now know that this object is also returning to our solar system. Yeah, well, uh, the effects, uh, in in fact, I got a two-part series uh, CD, so in one of my later releases, it's called The uh, Physics of Ancient Celestial Catastrophes. Oh, really? That's cool. I go through the the Noah event, I go through the Moses event, uh, I talk about the the Mayans, I talk about the the various scientific, and I, I, I break them apart scientifically, and I say this is what they were talking about. Wow. But of course, they were they were seeing through their eyes in the best way they could describe. Uh, that's why when we started out today, I was talking about the red hand of death on the, on my web page, and we were talking about that. Uh, right. That is a physical effect combination of auroras in the upper atmosphere. And the uh, the sulfur dioxide, and the reason this time in January 2014 we're going to be connecting with Jupiter electrically through the comet. So that comet is going to be pulling in a lot of sulfur dioxide, and we're going to be subject to that. So once again, we could be seeing this rain of sulfur dioxide, basically fine powder, sub- uh, uh, molecular uh, grade um, sulfur dioxide, falling into the atmosphere and then it follows the jet stream and and then it starts dropping out like fingers and that's what the ancients saw so now wow, what i've been able it. to do is to describe the physics of what's going on uh-huh. and then you couple this with the, the very large scale auroras because the comet is connecting to us electrically and that's what the red hand of death was and the sulfur dioxide coming down making the rivers red the water it polluted all the water and yeah, so it, it does something else too dr dean ward was on the program and dr ward is a, a climatologist uh, hypothesized that uh, sulfur dioxide in the upper atmosphere could destroy the uh, ozone layer uh, and also would change the albedo of the Earth's reflecting sunlight out, so you could end up with a dual activity of the ozone layer going through, so you get a tremendous amount of radiation at ground level, and you get the pollution ar- arising at the ground, which will also raise ground level ozone levels tremendously. So you get ground level ozone uh, when the uh, high energy ultraviolet light strikes the ground, and you get the pollution from sulfur dioxide, which of course forms hydrogen, you know, sulfuric acid, so it forms acid rain. 
and the destruction area of the upper ozone layer until it repairs itself. Well, the, yeah, the laundry list of effects is very long. But uh, what the people, you know, and at that time, you know, what did they talk about? They talked about the high winds. The Hopi talked about the devil winds. And, and that's you mentioned that, too, and I really like that analysis where you take the Hopis who were fully removed from the, say, the Mideast where the Moses event occurred, and they right. recount uh, the passage for passage all the same effects. You know, what's the probability of that happening? Not going to happen. That's why when you see these convergent events, you're having different disparate intelligent groups of people that are good observers. To them, the sky was their HDTV. Their sky wasn't an HDTV in their living room or their or their bar. It was the sky. So they knew the sky. It was crystal clear. There was no such thing as light pollution. And the high priests and the and scientists then to them, every activity, every move, in fact, even the time of when you would plant and reap and having marriage and ceremonies in every religion was tied directly to events in the sky. Yeah, yeah. That's, uh, and they, they lived out there. And uh, also, I should go back to Carl Sagan, Cosmos series. Um, I feel that right now, and I'm very proud of this, that I'm reversing what Carl Sagan did in the Cosmos series. His job was to make it placid, that the universe is out there. Sure, there's big energy, but it's way out there and way removed and way out of our time frame, and it could never happen here. And what I'm doing is trying in this uh, six-part series, doing my best to reverse that idea and know that outer space is a, it's a bad place to be. And Earth well, is, you know... We should, we should have a phone app for what I call space weather, not just regular weather, but space weather, because if you have a bad CME coming, it's going to hit you with protons, electrons, and other things that can change behavior, it can change biology, it can change the ozone layer. We know they can even punch holes in the ozone layer if you have certain kinds of coronal mass ejections. And these plasma discharges, as you said, they can trigger off earthquakes. We could have a major superstorms and or major earthquakes or volcanic activity as uh, January 2014. Uh, or at any time when these objects get close enough that this one, which is quite a bit smaller, 197 meters, passes February 15th, uh, my birthday next February, who knows how close it's going to get because they've cut off the data. The fact that they're withholding data makes me very concerned. Why yeah, are we not getting that data? Is. Yeah, yeah, that is. It used to be one half lunar distance, and now, as of May, it's only 5,000 miles off the Earth's surface. When you have an object that big, that's pretty darn close. I mean, that's literally like, you know, whizzing past your ear if you're a military guy, and you hear, as they say, if you hear a bullet whiz, it means you're still alive. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but the, there's uh, a tremendous amount of uh, activity that's going to come up here in the next year. So uh, I want people to uh, be aware of this. And we're going to be doing specials on this every week with the amazing Professor McCanny. Visit his website, listen to his show, get his books and materials. You want to get informed and watch this special, 2012 Countdown to Apocalypse, History Channel 2. We'll be back in just a moment. Welcome back and... Uh, Amazing show. Um, Professor McCann, your website is uh, jmccanney.com. Is that right? Or if you want to actually, let's no. do the shorter version. Do, let's do the shorter version yeah. to so make sure that we have the correct uh, email address, which is uh, the one I have here is jmccsci.com. That's the short version, right. jmccsci.com. Right. That's the short version. That's the short URL, and that's the best one to use. Just yeah. the other one, the, the long one is jmccannyscience.com, but uh, with all the letters, it's too much chance of getting it wrong. And uh, I, at one point, had about 57 typo-squatting sites around my site name. So if you met one letter wrong in any combination, if you dropped a C or if you put in two Ms or if you did any combination, if you put Jim or James or whatever, you would go to a, a bad site, let's put it that way. Some place. Yeah, really bad sites, yeah, yeah. Saturdays didn't want to be. 
Exactly. Now, you you also are putting all your your books over to ebooks, which they will be able to go to your website and obtain. You also have videos and other material, and I and I'm going to send you, by the way, uh, a team membership uh, email for live stream, so you can put video clips up in your site. They'll all automatically be over in our live stream channel if you have something important or breaking news. And you can do this 24 seven. In fact, there's even a free phone app on the Android or iPhone. So all you do is you download the free app. You can actually literally be anywhere where you come up with an idea. You're in your backyard and you say, oh, my gosh, i got to put this five-minute idea down. You can actually stand there or just recite it with your own iPhone and do a report. That's how amazing it is nowadays. So live stream allows you to do that now. Oh, wow. Yeah, this yeah. is, uh, you know, those, those kind of things will become handy here. Yeah. As we progress into, especially this next year, the ability to get information to people. Yeah, is because if be people need to be prepared, important. you know. For example, we should have known that the storm was coming to the Northeast. I know that this storm was manipulated and controlled. There's ways of superheating the upper atmosphere. The way they do it is they, they you know, put nanoparticles in the upper atmosphere and they either heat it with our harp or, or space based lasers. Uh, this was a steered storm, and, it, and, and I believe it had a definite effects on the election. When it was this close, I, I guarantee it had an effect. And besides the, you know, the withdrawal of any kind of combativeness by Romney, which I found kind of obscene in the second and third debate, I just don't understand. It's like he threw the fight. It must have been told by Don King, Satan, who was running it, and saying, well, you know, you got to throw the fight and let Obama have a second term. Uh, so I, I, just, I uh, said all along that he was put up to lose. He was the straw horse. He was the he was the dull. Just look throughout history. All the people have been put up. The the weak dull yeah. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. The people that were were not going to win. You know, they, they were just put there to to be a uh, hold a place, so to speak. And also to distract and and uh, immobilize and dishearten. For example, the uh, conservative Christian right, uh, the people that wanted to ask questions. For example. Obama hasn't done anything of substance. People didn't vote necessarily for Obama in this election. They were more terrified by the negative statements and the gaffes by uh, Romney and the fact he'd flipped on so many things and they thought he was going to do austerity fascism. Uh, they were concerned because he was a Mormon quote, in a cult if they're a Christian right and if they were a libertarian they thought, oh, he's not going to do what we want. So uh, it was almost engineered to fail. And of course the statisticians that took the psychological and the statistical analysis like the gentleman I posted up on Friday, he turned out to be correct. Uh, in other words, uh, you know, listen and smell the the data, not the coffee. And yeah. I think if we'd smell the data better, just like uh, you do with the science of, you know, space weather, we would probably be a lot better off. But uh, an uninformed public is a victimized public, and a public where things like martial law, starvation, devastation, crop failures can happen, and uh, people don't what people don't know can hurt and can kill them. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's uh, we're heading into some very interesting times, and uh, that's that's all I can say. I think the, the, one of the most interesting things I've seen, and actually sometimes it's what you don't see uh, with this comet, for example. It's NASA is not saying anything, um, and uh, I, I think on the political scene we're talking about the election. You yeah, know, yeah. What's my analysis when the election is over? I said uh, on my homepage, I said, don't vote because it doesn't matter. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. That was yeah, my yeah. attitude. It uh, really doesn't matter. I mean, the two, both, both of them are globalists. I thought, as I compared the two, the diagnosis was if you get Obama, you get a heart attack and a pulmonary embolism, and you're dead in the morning. You get Romney, you might have a diagnosis of cancer. It's very probable. And with the right natural and other care, you might survive. You might get breathing space. But they're both globalists. And, uh, you know, they're trying to sell austerity fascism as a solution for the problem when really need it right off the debt, build infrastructure, and have things like a defensive earth policy, which the LaRouche Foundation talked about. And what you're trying to do is say space isn't safe. Space is dangerous. It's like our little planet Earth that's got this magnetosphere around it is in a seething, literally, of boiling cauldron of fire which is the universe it's really like a microwave cosmic ray fire and in fact we are living with a little blue planet a little sapphire around the yellow dwarf star we're literally floating in space or in literally the lake of fire people talk about the lake of fire you know of hell well we're in that lake of fire it's called the universe and it's not just way out there so many light years it's here 
It's, uh, you know, asteroids and comets, it's plasma discharges, it's coronal mass ejections that can blast away at the Earth. Uh, you know, it's a violent Earth itself where yeah. tsunamis yeah. can occur. I mean, uh, and people think these are distant. They only happen every so many hundred million years or whatever. That's not true. The big earthquakes along Cascadia happen every 300 years. Big earthquakes from the Azores happen every 300 years, roughly off the Azor Mountains, every three to 500 years. We're due for a whole lot of really bad stuff, and all you need is a plasma discharge, the gravitonic effects of a near-Earth object, the plasma discharges, and things can happen that can rearrange the deck chairs on the Titanic of Earth. Yeah, the, the, you mentioned like over by the Azores there. Um, that's something that when uh, Ignatius Donnelly described the coal fields in Pennsylvania where he was born, um, they, uh, he talked about them in layers, and they'd come in. But basically that's what happened. These tidal waves from the Azores would come over, these tsunamis and take all of the plant material and stack it up and that's where the cold fields came from and then dirt and sediment would build up on top of that and then whoosh in comes again and so they were in layers uh, you know natural uh, standard science has not explained these kind of phenomena you know that how did these uh, the cold fields of pennsylvania form well if you can imagine a tsunami that can come all the way in from the Atlantic Ocean all the way to Pennsylvania, that's a lot of territory. Yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah that's, it really is. Yeah, it's, it, and the thing is, these things are, we're already seeing earth changes. We're seeing these weird sinkholes all over the place. The earthquakes and volcanoes just since March 11th of 2011 have gone up 500%. We're having rumblings, like there was a big earthquake today, a 7.5 off of the east coast of Mexico, of uh, Yucatan Peninsula this morning, uh, oh. 7.5. We had a 7.7 .7 up in the Queen Charlotte Islands, the extension of the, of the, of the, uh, the major fault line that comes through California. You know, so things are going to start happening, rocking and rolling, and all we need is a near Earth object or planetary alignment they call syzygy and para and, and apogee, where you have a near Earth object passing or syzygy in alignment, and uh, especially with there's plasma transfers. Uh, tell us about some of these things in the closing minutes because I think people should understand, and you go on your site all the time and talk about it. These things you could. You can predict earthquakes, and that's one of the things I'm really concerned about. With we talked about this last week, these Italian scientists are told you can't predict volcanoes and earthquakes, and the idea that they're going to jail them I find very concerning. Uh, I find it's basically a scare tactic to say, "Now shut up and don't tell the public." Yeah, well, there was there was I don't see where there was a crime they committed. You have to pass a law saying there's a crime before you can convict somebody of that crime. And, and that didn't happen. It's just like they made the law after the fact. And, and I, I think these guys were were taking money, government money, to be on a program, and then to come out afterwards and say we have no predictive value, that's a little hokey. But it, I don't know if it warrants a six-year jail sentence. No, I mean, but, you can say that it was a fraud in terms of taking money for and there's no predictive value. But I think they knew in advance the reason why they said that is they're already threatened that they're going to be prosecuted uh, for not warning when these 300 and some people died. Yeah, you know, well, that's, that's an interesting case there, yeah. Yeah, it is. It's uh, very bizarre. When is your show on, uh, Professor McCanny? When do you have your radio show? It's 6 p.m. Thursday evenings from WWCR 5070 megahertz out of Nashville. And, and that's a uh, shortwave, right? Yes, yeah, shortwave. And, uh, of course, all of the listings for that are on my webpage. So right, follow the amazing. link to my webpage. And every Wednesday, the amazing Professor McKenny is on this program giving us updates. And we'll soon be getting also an invitation to be a live stream broadcaster on the Nutramedical Clay and Iron Network. We'll be back in just a moment with, uh, or tomorrow, with Tex Mars. You don't want to miss him. And uh, Tim Alexander, Chris Harris, our nuclear expert, with an update on the NRC, San Onofre, Fukushima, and much more. Thank you, Professor McKenny.